We have wish to start right on time, but uh, unfortunately, because of the rain, we need to give a little bit of time to the people who are getting late. So we take another about 10 15 minutes, and then we start by about 6 15. So we are around. We have some very, very experienced senior chief engineers here, especially for you guys. Uh, one have any questions on marine engineering? They are the experts. They have done it, been there, done that, everything. So yeah, after this, we will have some fellowship as well. At that time, uh, talk with them, make use of this opportunity. It's free. You don't have to pay a cent. And that kind of knowledge to pick up from your seniors is difficult, and to get. So much of information into a small space like this is tough and you just won't believe the amount of information if I put it into what micro dots, it will overflow this room. The information that these gentlemen hold, this little bit only, we have 300 members so if I get all, all 300, it will be a whole vast knowledge because each person has experienced something that another person has been. So this is very engineering experience and getting to know what it is. So uh, please give me 15 minutes and then start at 16. Okay.
as well, but that again it is connected to something else that we are going to discuss later, right? This is uh, energy efficiency. If you lose, uh, use less fuel, of course, you save energy because we need something, a fuel to generate energy, is it? So if you cut it down, you can save energy. But not only save the energy, you also contribute to a lesser pollution to the environment. So that is what basically is energy efficiency. And then we will see how this is connected to to our area that is shipping. Uh, energy efficiency is not common only to shipping, but it is basically common to everyone. Be it shipping, be it transportation, be it energy sector, be it any uh, other industry. Energy saving has now become a hot topic actually. So if you have, let's say if you have a car, how, how do you make it energy efficient? Let's say if you have a coal car. Can you make it uh, energy efficient? I think you have the technology now. Mm -hmm. You take the engine now, <laughs> take the engine now and put the uh, battery to run it. Yes? Or a bull? <laughs> yes. Oh, or you can leave the car at home and run a bicycle. Mm -hmm. Yes? It's one way of saving energy. Okay, I know you leave the car at home and go in the bus, public car. That's one way of energy. But we have the latest cars with all these facilities where they burn less fuel. That means with the latest technology there, you have all seen the hybrid cars now. So what basically does is it saves energy. Yes, it gives you the maximum mileage per liter of fuel that you burn. So that is basically energy saving. But if you leave the car at home and go by a bicycle, that is also energy saving. But you are in a spending energy, but the car you will stop burning or, or reduce burning the fossil fuel. So the ship energy efficiency is not, uh, not a different to that one. What we are trying to do is we are trying to save fuel, thereby reducing the amount of energy that is used to propel a ship. So if you look at why uh, all of a sudden the world start talking about energy efficiency, it's because of this word here, greenhouse gas, effects of global warming. The uh, greenhouse gas that we are emitting, or we are emitting into the atmosphere because of our <coughs> activity. Otherwise, you need uh, greenhouse gas to survive. If we don't have greenhouse gas in our atmosphere, what will happen? Our earth temperature, the scientists say, might go down to minus 80, then we will all die. So, we need certain amount of greenhouse gas in our atmosphere just to have the, the correct temperature for us to live. But the problem here is that because of our activities, we are adding more greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. So that's not good. That is what is happening with this global warming. So when you put more greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, our global temperature or the earth temperature will go up, right? And we have come to a situation now, our sea ice melting, the glaciers are melting, we have floods, we have heat waves, we have erosion, all these because of, and the rising sea level is because of this here. And it is connected to greenhouse, and by reducing the fossil fuel burning, 
we will reduce <coughs> the effect of having greenhouse gas and then we will make it an energy efficiency chip. So we have to consider only about the chips, we are not uh, talking about the other industries. Is the greenhouse effect? Earth is a comfortable place for living things. It's just the right temperature for plants and animals, including humans, to thrive. Why is Earth so special? Well, one reason is the greenhouse effect. A greenhouse is a building with glass walls and glass roof. The clear glass allows sunlight to shine into the greenhouse while also trapping the sun's heat inside. This is how a greenhouse keeps plants warm even at night and in the winter. The greenhouse effect keeps Earth warm in pretty much the same way. Earth isn't surrounded by glass, but it is surrounded by a jacket of gases called the atmosphere. In the daytime, the sun shines through the atmosphere, warming Earth's surface. After the sun goes down, Earth's surface cools. This releases heat back into the air. But some of that heat is trapped by the gases in the atmosphere. These heat trapping gases are called greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane are all examples of greenhouse gases. Earth needs a balance of greenhouse gases to maintain just the right temperature for living things. But some human activities are changing Earth's natural greenhouse effect. For example, burning fossil fuels like coal and oil releases more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. These extra greenhouse gases can cause the atmosphere to trap more and more heat, leading to a warmer Earth. NASA satellites are constantly measuring the gases in our atmosphere from space. They've observed increases in the amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. The information from NASA satellites can help scientists figure out where greenhouse gases are coming from and how they are ending up in our atmosphere. This information will help us better understand the impact that greenhouse gases have on our climate and help us better understand this very special greenhouse that we call home. Find out. So now you know what is greenhouse, right? Now there is a question I can ask. Why only CO2, methane, and CO2, methane, and water? Water, nitrous oxide, why only these are greenhouse gas? Why not others? We have oxygen, we have nitrogen, we have so many other gases in the atmosphere, why they are not greenhouse gas? Why only these are considered greenhouse Yeah, if you take uh, oxygen, oxygen molecule has two atoms like this. Yeah? If you take CO2, you have one, two here. But in this CO2, this bond is symmetrical, whereas it is not here. When you have infrared, touching this bond, this can stretch and absorb heat. But whereas the O2 molecule and the other molecule, nitrogen or helium, they don't have this property. That's why they are called greenhouse gases because this bond is stretching. Even though you manage to stretch these bonds here, it will not absorb Normally, the heat comes to the earth the way of IR, oxygen, other oxygen in infrared. So, this infrared will touch in this bond and this will stretch and this will absorb the heat. That's why these guys are dangerous and that's why they are called greenhouse gas. Others are not. What does it mean, stretch? This is bond, one the, the bond can stretch. It will not damage, but it will stretch and absorb the heat. But whereas this bond here, we cannot do it. So that's why you have, these are the commonly known uh, greenhouse gases. The green
greenhouse gas actually absorbs and emits radiant heat generally using infrared rays, causing a greenhouse effect. So that's the effect that we saw on the on the little video that you just watched. And these are the, the commonly known uh, greenhouse gases that are existing in our atmosphere. Even the water vapor is a greenhouse gas. But there is something called uh, lifetime of these gases. When it comes to water, the lifetime is very, very less. Maybe 24 hours. That's what we see now. Just, just before we came here, they were all pouring down. So these water vapors does not exist in the atmosphere more than 24 hours, 78 hours, that's very little. But when it comes to CO2, this guy can stay in the atmosphere for 1000 years or even more. That is the danger. Methane, normally, if you release it to, if you release it to the uh, atmosphere now, just now, it will stay roughly about 10 years. And the nitrous oxide, they all have their lifetime. Ozone, this is CFC and HFC. These are per fluorocarbon. These are the well known uh, greenhouse gases. And due to the activities of humans, we are adding into the atmosphere more and more of these gases. Otherwise, they are there in the atmosphere, but there is an energy balance. There is a natural energy balance in the, in the atmosphere. So it will stay as it is. But what we are doing now, because of our, uh, we are looking for our comfortable zones and we have done so many things. We are using, overusing things and emitting these gases into the atmosphere. So we are actually adding them up, which we are not supposed to do. So if you look up to those gases that I the, that you saw in the previous slide, that these guys. Now there is a key difference between each of these gases. There is something called radiative efficiency. That means how much energy that those gases can absorb, and then how long they stay in that atmosphere in the lifetime. And then what uh, scientists did actually, they, they defined something called global warming potential indicator. That means it's a measure of how much energy is absorbed by one ton of those gases <coughs> relative to one ton of CO2. And they gave a number. So you start with CO2, the global warming potential is one. Right? Because you divide the same number with one. And if you take methane, it's 20 to 30, over 100 years. And say, methane, if you emit methane today, <coughs> it lasts about a decade on average, which is much less than CO2. Because CO2 lasts about thousands of years. But the problem is, this guy here is absorbing 25% more heat than the CO2 does. So we will come to that point. That's why the, the shipping industry now says LNG is not the answer for the clean fuels. LNG is, is taken now as, as a transitional fuel because as you know, the ships, when they get older, their maintenance on the engines and the equipment, depending on the ship order, right, and depending on the people on board, you may not maintain your ships properly. The ship owner will not invest money on the maintenance. He will not give you spare parts. So what will happen at the end? We will emit pure methane. It's called methane slip. So that is dangerous. That is more dangerous than CO2 itself. If pure methane is emitted, 
by the verb to eat. Let's say you convert the half of the verb to eat. Verb to eat is roughly about uh, 100,000 now. Uh, if you convert half of it to LNG and run it on LNG, what happens if there is incomplete combustion? Definitely there will be. Then you are emitting <coughs> pure methane into the atmosphere, not only in from the ship combustion, but during bunkering, during transfer, they all emit methane. So that's why they say methane is not the not the answer. It can be used as a transitional fuel. And uh, nitrous oxide, it has a value of DWP value of 273. Emitted today will remain in atmosphere for 100 years. And these guys are very high global warming poten potentials and they will, if emitted to atmosphere, they will stay in 1,000 or 10,000, I don't know, so many thousand years. They will not be so. So, if you take After all these things, this is the gases that, these are the gases that you go and stay in the atmosphere for a long, long time, and then you have uh, CO2, and then you have nitrogen oxide, and of course the methane has a lesser lifetime in the atmosphere, but he is dangerous. These are the commonly known emissions. We have CO2, we have nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, and this uh, black smoke that you see from the vehicle, that's a uh, particular uh, carbon uh, matters actually, with uh, unburned carbon emitting from the vehicle. Now, if you have a complete combustion in your vehicle or ship's engine, what you have is what you have. If you have a complete combustion in your engine, what you have, what you end up with, CO2 and water. Yes. And how does this guy come out? Now you need the air into the engine, yes? So if you put more air into the engine, more air into the engine, the, the air contains, what is the percentage of nitrogen the air contains? So there is enough nitrogen inside. So when you have more air and less fuel, what happens is this nitrogen, excess nitrogen in, in the air inside the engine will form with connect with oxygen and then will form nitrogen oxide. And salvo of course you have it in the in the fuel. Carbon monoxide is is a result of incomplete combustion. And uh, hydrocarbon, of course, every fuel is a hydrocarbon. Even methane is a hydrocarbon, but it has only one carbon. But uh, the vis more viscous the fuel is going to get, you have a chain of carbons. So there is always the, the fossil fuel that we are using, we have so many carbons because it, it's a chain of carbons. So this Hydrocarbon is always released from your chip engine, from your vehicle, and this is again the black smoke. This particular uh, particular matter we call it, and then uh, you see the the buses smoking. This is where the carbon particles are. So these are the commonly known emissions. But of course, other than CO2, the shipping industry managed to cut down this one and this one. Yes, we have a NOx uh, technical code for engine which is more than 375 kilowatts. You have to have a NOx technical code. What they have done is actually they have reduced the temperature inside the combustion chamber in order not to form the NOx to a certain level. It does not mean that it is not forming, but it does. But we have reduced it so that. We are issuing a certificate for these engines called Engine Air Pollution Certificate, 
EIABB to have seen it on board. So those engines are certified for reduction of NOx. Sulfur actually is coming from fuel, but there is a global sulfur cap now, which is globally you can use 0.5 sulfur, and if you go to emission control areas, you will only use 0.1 sulfur in the fuel. We call it now low fuel, uh, low sulfur fuel. So we managed to reduce this one and this one, but now the problem is to reduce CO2 from the stream there. And now if you look at this one, this is global greenhouse gas emission as a total percentage. So look at this industry, electricity heat production and transport. If you put these three together, it will add up to about 60% of the total emission to the global emission, right? Out of this 14%, if you take it as a global emission, shipping is roughly about 2.7 to 3. That's what the shipping is there from the greenhouse gas. But it's so low, but if you have 14% from the other, this is including aviation and shipping, but the, the show based transportation is much more, and the electricity generation is 25%, and the other industry is 21%. Of course, this is the agriculture factor. Uh, agriculture sector is 24% and the other energy. When they are producing other energy, it generates about 10%. So, it's a global problem now. The United Nations, IMO, European Union, and everybody is involved in this race. Right? It's not only Chile. What we are expecting is this year, net carbon, CO. We don't want any carbon fuel. We want our fuel to be carbon free. Why? The scientists say the earth has warmed up to 1.1 degrees now from the pre-industrial level. If you take pre-industrial level here, and from that year onwards, due to our activities, the Earth has more 1.1 degrees. But they say if we don't stop at 1.5, we will end up with... Sorry. So if you don't stop at 1.5, we will end up with more disaster. To be reduced by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. And uh, the IMO, the IMO targets are right. So the target is actually aimed at 2050 net zero. We don't use, we do not use carbon well by this. Uh, 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 small increase from one to one point five to one. There are so many uh, agencies. One is the uh, Energy uh, International Energy Commission, Energy Association. There are so many uh, uh, agencies which are measuring all these things and feeding into right. They have a special committee.
but some of the countries denounced this and they moved away from this one because what it was doing, it was binding uh, the developed countries for emission reduction. So they said, no, we can't, we can't do it. Only, only the developed countries can't do it. So some of the countries actually move away from this one. And then uh, in 2015, yeah. parties to this convention, they signed this Paris Agreement. This Paris Agreement is now a major agreement between the United Nations. And this is where uh, there are supporting agencies, as Mr. Nigel Surya just questioned, there are uh, supporting agencies and research centers which are doing all these uh, calculations. Even the NASA, just there are the energy, uh, international energy uh, institutes that are doing all this research, and they are they are feeding uh, the United Nations these committees with all the required data. Otherwise, they can they can't formulate these uh, rules and regulations. And then uh, you have heard this COP 27 uh, last year November. We were seeing this on the TV, the COPIS conference of parties. So under this Paris Agreement, all these members, regulatory members, they are having this COP27 to discuss the measures that each country has taken. So our president went there, I don't know what he said, he probably said that we are issuing emission, emission, <laughs> emission test report for our vehicle. And then he came up uh, with the idea, and he said that um, the, the bigger countries, developed countries, uh, should be penalized. Yes? Do you agree with that one? Now let's take China, for instance. Now we are building the ships here, but we bring steel from China, we bring machinery from China, even shirt, ties, everything is coming from China. Okay. If China says, <laughs> okay, what we will do from now on, then what will happen? Your phone will be dead in no time, my laptop will not work, nothing will happen. So China alone, you can't hold responsible for China alone for doing all this pollution. And we are partly responsible for that because we are consuming. We are the, outs the people outside the world are consuming more things than the Chinese do, I think. Yes? So we cannot actually talk like that and say we, we have to penalize this, uh, uh, penalize these uh, bigger countries for polluting. Yes, they are doing the, the but biggest polluter, polluter is, is United States, and then the second is uh, China, and third is India. But we cannot say that we should, uh, they should pay for us. Because they are polluting. But they are polluting because we are consuming. And that's what that much pollution. So on the one, two, three is because uh, of the controls in those countries or it's just a cycle? No, no, their industry is, is actually they cannot control. Right? They have so much of vehicle, they have but they are doing so many things. They are uh, they are, uh, the, the, they have something called carbon capture, which they the industries, they, they capture the carbon the, the, from the exhaust, what they are using, and they liquefy it and store under the carbon capture and then emission uh, trading systems where you are, I will explain to you later, where they give you some permits for your factory. If you are, say, if you say you are emitting only one ton of CO2, then you buy permits for one ton. But if you, yeah, if you emit more, then you have to pay again and buy. If you emit less, <coughs> then you can relate that into somebody else. So there is a big carbon market coming up back there with this one. So this this is the that COP27 conference last said it in Egypt, November uh, last year. So then we have uh, IMO shipping emission targets, which is going to be aligned with the UN target. And this is the EU strategy. The EU countries are, are, are very interested in that. 
in controlling greenhouse gases and they are ahead of all the others. And they, are, they have a lot of uh, controlling mechanisms. One is this emission trade system, which I just explained to you. And they also have in Germany, uh, in Germany, one country where there is carbon capture. There are industries where uh, the exhaust is uh, mixed with uh, uh, amines, and then amines converts the carbon in the exhaust into carbon dioxide, and they liquefy the carbon dioxide, and then it's stored under the earth. But the problem is, the scientist says, nobody knows what will happen to that CO2. Will it come out one day? That is unsure. But for the time being, they do it. But they say if what will happen to this CO2 later, nobody knows. Because there has been enough, uh, hasn't been enough research on that. Right, these are the, so the IMO started working and they did uh, some studies. First study in 2000, second study in 2009, third study, fourth study. Now look at uh, this one. This is only 1.8% 1, 1. of the world's uh, total. Anthropogenic means, uh, anthropogenic means this is uh, done by human, human actually, right? We are created. So it was from the shipping, it was in 2000, uh, well, the 2000 study showed uh, in 1996, the emission from the shipping was only 1.8. And in 2009, it became 2.7. And the third IMO study, which was published in 2014, it has come to come down to 2.2. There are reasons for this one. Probably because the shipping decision. <coughs> the, most of the ships, more, not more, many, has to be laid up. So that's why it has come down. But again, in the fourth, uh, IMO study, July 2020, there is 9.6% increase because we started again trading in the ship. Number of ships went up and then it went up. And, but if we don't do anything, if IMO does not do anything, this is what will happen to us. Projected emission by 2050, 9230 of 2000 emission we because they have taken in this study they have taken 2008 as a baseline right we have to start from somewhere so they took 2008 as the baseline because it, 2008 was the least uh, emission reference line so they took it as 2008 and if we don't do anything this is what happens IMO said, no, we can't wait. We have to do something. Now, see, they calculated CO2, greenhouse gas emission from various six types. Containers, 23 percent. Because we have many containers. Bulk area is the second largest, and it's 19 percent. Oil tankers, 13 percent. And all the other categories, 40 that is all the other categories, which includes uh, smaller ships as well, which uh, IMO does not actually regulate, or the smaller ships are not uh, uh, regulated that much. But they are worried about these three categories. What about weights? Weights are not in. Weights are not in. So their strategy is to to have energy efficient ships to cut down greenhouse gas. That is where it starts. That's why we are talking about energy efficient ships because of greenhouse gas. This is the IMO ambition, visions and ambitions. Now, this line, if we don't do anything, it will go up here. And this is 
trimost vision and the ambition this is 2008 this is where we take the reference line and our target is to reduce the intensity by 40% in 2030 and then 2050 we have we are targeting to reduce another 70% in 2050 and here the imo wants carbon free so carbon free after this life but this is very difficult it's not easy because shipping alone is emitting 1 billion ton of co2 at this moment so bringing it down to this level is actually a task of everybody not just the uh, IMO it's all the countries the classification societies the ship builders ship brokers insurance everybody is target everybody has to be part of this right so IMO introduce uh, short term mid term and long term measures what was that dotted line this one the dotted line here yeah. this is if you don't do anything you go up. So the target is to bring this right down here mm. and from here to here. Right. Now I think uh, most of the chief engineers and the, the, the cadets who have sailed on board uh, are familiar with this one. Uh, the IMO brought in uh, short term, mid term and long term measures <laughs> in order to achieve that target. Just be spoken about. See part one. This is very interesting. Ship energy efficiency management plan, part four, in 2013. What IMO said, this is coming under Marco Annex Six, and when the when the ship had this one, we issued a separate certificate called International Energy Efficiency Certificate, or this C part four. But what happened? No. This was only a paper. Mr. Silva, Silva knows very well. This was only a paper on board. IMO gave guideline as to how you can reduce your energy. Right? There were so many guidelines: <coughs> our cleaning, trip optimization, retrofit, uh, using your energy efficiently. All these guidelines and the weather routing. They were given, and they were asked to make this plan. Everybody made this plan, but did nothing. And the gold just went. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. It was just a paper. This thing. But then, what ship owners thought? Ah, okay. This is IMO. This, this nothing will happen later. But look, then. E E I. Energy efficiency design. This started in 2013 as well for the new building. All the new build ships, which are applicable ones only, I will show you later. 400 of tonnage and above will have to meet this EEDI. EEDI means energy efficiency <coughs> design index that you calculate it during your design stage, which is actually the CO2 emitted in grams per ton mile. That means CO2 emitted per cargo carried. Per well, launch turbine, right? That is EEDI. So this has to be calculated during the new building stage, and that is called uh, required EEDI. And then we have to check what is the attained EEDI, which we do during the sea trial. So when you build a new ship. The EEDI is calculated and given to you, and then during testing sea trial, we have to see whether the attained EEDI is going to exceed the required EEDI. If it does, then we have to keep it down. But normally, this does not happen on the dockyard. They have very low EEDI for that category of ships. Up to 2030, there are three phases actually. 
each phase you are expected to reduce your EDI by by 10 percent. So that those chips are made uh, for the the final phase. The required one is 16.5, but they have 11 11.4 or something. So they are far less. They can even uh, stay in the trade for so so long unless until the IMO changes their strategy again. And then uh, same part two. So the IMO is very smart. Do you know why the same part two came? Because IMO wanted to know how much fuel the each type of chip is burning. When we saw this one, we never thought. But this was a trap. They wanted to know who are the culprits. Who are burning the highest fuel. That's why this one came in. Because they did not put it on a smaller ship, but they put it on 5,000 gross tonnage and above and said you have to report this seed part 2 is a plan as to how you show the IMO how to report your data on the fuel consumption on your main engine and your auxiliaries and any other auxiliaries that can be on board. So this, 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 that one, I can remember we were doing even before that. Yeah, you can. Nobody Monthly, yeah. there was a, a table that we had to calculate. Yeah, that, that depends on the company then. Yeah. But the actual uh, regulation came from 2019. So this is what uh, the IMO was aiming at. They wanted to find out who are the biggest culprits. And look, in, in 2023, you are getting energy efficiency existing ship index. Now, from this from this January, when the, the surveys on go, go, on go, go on board, for the first Marpole Annexic surveys, they have to be this one. You have to calculate this and find out there are uh, for each type and category of ships the IMO did uh, a reference number. So your ship when it is calculated you have to see your attained EEXI is less than the required EEXI. E required EEXI is, is already calculated for every ship type. right? So what you have to do, if it is more, then you have to bring it down. How you bring it down? Most of the vessel, what they do is they are putting engine power limitation. That means they, they limit the engine power. The two CAC vessel did uh, this month. They have to limit the engine power to attain the correct figure. So you go slow. Go slow. For a long time. They can only they have an overriding button uh, for the safety of the ship or any reason that you want to have a high power, they can override. But just like your old for record book or balance management uh, record book, you have to write everything. Where you did it, why you did it, all that has to be recorded on a on a manual. And this manual has to be approved by either flag or flag based society. And this, so if you go slow, you have to travel a long time. Yeah. It might magnify the whole thing. No, that, that's calculation is, is such that this is avoided. So this, is, yeah. this is challenged by two companies EEXI, CGM, they have challenged, but it's the same thing what Krishna has said. You can lower your power and go for a yeah, now the, what is the IMO's, uh, IMO's uh, reply to that one? You start the ship. <laughs> yeah, they said that. If your ship is cannot attain this one, get rid of And they are going to do it. Because if even globally you are accepted, the European Union will not accept you. That is the problem. That is what happened to uh, all the other rules and regulations. Yes, even MRV. The monitoring, verification, and reporting. The, you know, the global thing was DSC, data collecting system. But before that, MRV started. And they said, don't come here 
without having them up. So then the IMO has to step in and they said, okay, now we have to do the DS. Because the European Union said, don't come. If you come, we will do that. And for this one, IMO said, then that's why they are, um, they are expecting so many vessels to be scrapped. That is what is going to happen. And then you will have a same part three. Some, some, some. If EEX says, do we have a lot? No, but does we have data recording? No, the data recording you have to continue. Anyway, DSC you have to continue, right? No, no, EEX says that if you increase the power for your variety, you have to see it. You have a lot more. But we have a kind of which is automatically downloaded and stores. Yeah, then this record has to be maintained. Either hard copy or electronically, if somebody asks you, you have to show. So then, for C part 3 from 2023 January, it's called Ship Operational Carbon Intensity Management Plan. Now, this EEDI and EEXI are one time calculations. So if you calculate this one time and just stay like that, what will happen? There is no monitoring system. So they, the IMO wanted the monitoring system, which they said, okay, you bring now theme part three for vessel 5000 and above. Theme part three should contain ship operational carbon intensity management plan, which you have to tell in the plan or indicate in the plan how you uh, reduce this intensity, how you implement this one, and how you uh, control this one, and then how you improve. All this has to be made, mentioned in this plan, and this plan has to be approved. But here, this same part did not, you know, it, it, there was no requirement for approval from anybody. It was just a document only. That's why it was not given the proper uh, concern by all the ship owners. They just uh, stay. What we do is we, when we go for surveys, we just see where is your same one now. That's it. But <laughs> not the contents. Not the contents. No, no, nobody <laughs> bothered to <laughs> look at this. Yeah. And then uh, this one, same part two, needed the approvals and also compliance certificate, which we issued. And this one also needed another compliance certificate. So when you go on board a ship, you will have seen part one, part two, and part three. You cannot uh, get rid of any of these. You know, need to have all three on board. And this will be checked from the first uh, first annual or intermediate survey after January 2023. With by glass and all the records. Yes. And actually, this one, uh, this C part three, and uh, this EEXI, you have to prepare a technical manual and uh, onboard management, maintenance management manual as well because you are picking, picking uh, new equipment. You can either limit the power by limiting the engine power or the shaft power. But most of the owners they go for limiting the engine power. And what about maintenance? No maintenance you your, your power is limited, you can't go beyond that. Only thing is you, there is a override button. It has to be fitted in the engine room or on the bridge. So every time you override, you have to, it has to be recorded. It can be electronically recorded or, or manually recorded. And you should be able to justify that. Why you did Yes, why you did Right. So this, all this regulation came in Mahapur uh, Annex 6. For a long time, ship energy was a voluntary. That's why I said, he said he had this on board because this was a voluntary thing from the company. But then, IMO made it mandatory and then they added another chapter, chapter 4. To Mapur and Essex, and then made these regulations. 
regulation 9, the 19 means application, and uh, attain EEDI, required EEDI, which I explained to you, and the C, energy management plan, and regulation 23 is a technical cooperation technology transfer. And uh, those powerful countries and companies, they have to develop the technical uh, know-how and then they have to cooperate with other countries and also the transfer of knowledge. This, this is something that you probably not uh, see in the other convention. This is something very interesting. You can do something, innovate something, implement, but you have to transfer the knowledge to another country who is in need of it. So this is something very unique. So this is how the, the, the plan has to work. You design and then you plan to operate and improve the energy efficiency. That's plan and operate. Then you have to operate the system and then you have to monitor. And this guy here is actually energy efficiency operational index. This was a voluntary this thing that gave by the IMO to the shipboard. You have, you can have your own check, but then I don't think many many companies did this one. So E P O I was just uh, just a word. It was not mandatory actually, but it just just for you to check how efficient you are. So it's the ratio of the carbon dioxide the ship emit per ton mile of work. This is actually work done by the ship. These are the, the EDI applicable vessels. See the bulk carriers, gas carriers, tankers, container ships, general dry cargo, except livestock, barge carriers, heavy lifters, yacht carriers, nuclear fuel, which is not applicable, refrigerated cargo, combination carriers, passenger ships, low road cargo ships, and low road passenger ships. So these types coming under EDI and EISI. This is simply a, this is a simple equation, but this is more complete, complex. I just simplified this one. But this is a, it's a long one. Uh, which more addition to this one, but it's a complex uh, calculation. Here, now you see your ship is efficient. If you carry as much cargo as you can, yes? If you carry less cargo, what will happen to this one? It will go up. The EEDI will, value will go up. So you need to carry cargo efficient. It's not only uh, emission, but it's also connected with dead weight. If you keep this this as a constant for a, for a certain certain speed, if you don't carry enough cargo, your ship is not going to be efficient. That's what the EDI and EXI suggest to us. These are now, this EDI the limits are not achieved in, 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 in one phase. That's why I said the, the ships that we are building in Dockyard, those ships are covered up to here. That uh, general cargo ship, uh, EEDI value is 16 point something for the third phase, but still they are managing 11.45 or something, 11.74. So it's far below, far below the, the required what is required in phase three. So if there is another one addition here by the IMO, still you can run the ship. So the, all the new designs are meeting this one. They are, they are keeping it as low as possible, expecting that this there will be another phase because our target is when? 2050, yes? Our target is 2050. So they are expecting that this will be even stricter. There will be more phases. 
So what they do, the new all the new designers actually ship owners tell them we want this EEDI to be as low as possible. So they can they can uh, use the vessel even if no limits are brought in. So uh, these bulk carriers, depending on the dead weight, the phase one, this there was no applicability, and phase uh, phase zero. This is starting from 2008, uh, 2008 reference line, but started uh, the phase period is 1st January 2013 to 31st 24, and this is phase one. This is 10% reduction from year to year, <coughs> and then you have to go to 20% reduction, and here 30% reduction. So all these uh, vessels in this dead weight range has to achieve this. So this is uh, carbon intensity indicator. It's also a operational check, right? If there is no operational check, as I said, the EXI and the EDI is one-time calculation. You just calculate and keep it, it will not be checked. So I, you, we have to report now. Annually, you have to report this. <coughs> Just like the uh, DAC, data collecting system, it is already there, you have to continue this one. And then see, the data collecting system, uh, either the, when you submit it to a classification society or any other service provider, they will do the calculation of CE, right? And then they will report it to IMO. And for the European Union, they have to report it to European Union. So what they did actually, they according to the CEI values, there are references value actually that they have recalculated, and they are going to put your ships on scale A to E. You have to run your ship from scale A to C. If you go below below C, then you have to bring it up to. C, at least C. So they have given the corrective measures. You have to give the corrective measures in this scene 3 that we talked about before. If it goes down that category, then you have to have a corrective measures in that plan. And then you have to implement this and then bring it up to C. And if you run the, the vessel for three years, I think, yes, three years, scale for three years or on E for one year, the corrective action plan to be implemented. So this one needs third party approval. And as I said, we will check this one on the first uh, periodical survey after the January 1st, 2023. When, when the surveys go on board, they will check. Unlike EXI, CEI is a good representation of the actual operation of the ship because annually you are calculating and then annually you see what is your carbon intensity indicator. You cannot, uh, if it is going up, you have to make, uh, take measures to reduce it. And each, uh, each uh, three year phase, you have to have certain reduction, which is uh, for a certain, let's say, bulk carrier. The IMO says you need to have uh, this much of reduction each three year period. So this, these are very, uh, how to say, it's very, uh, probably the ship owners will find very, very difficult to maintain. But if this continues, what will happen when you want to charter your vessel? The charter will ask, look, if your energy efficiency, these things are not met, I will not charge in US. This is where the, the problem comes. And the insurance uh, underwriters, they will refuse to insure your vessel. They will say your, your ship is not uh, energy efficient, so therefore we will not insure. So it will come to that. It will come. So by hook or crook, we have to do this one. Right. These are how we can improve the energy efficiencies.
on board. Of course, uh, the easiest one is uh, speed reader, right? When you this we did the until recently most of the ship owners ran their vessels on on low speed. But the problem is those engines were not made to run on uh, low speed. They were off design. Though we ran, we had to do a lot of things. We had to blank the turbochargers, right? We had to alter the propellers. But then because those engines were, were not meant to run on low load. They were designed to run at a certain load which they are comfortable with. And then vessel utilization. If you have a fleet of vessel, how you utilize them, right? You send a big vessel to, to collect the cargo or you send two smaller vessels that you have to decide on you uh, by, by the company as to how you utilize your fleet of vessels. Of course, if you have only one vessel, you have no more than that you. But if you have a fleet of vessels, how do you utilize your ships is to save energy. And uh, expected, uh, these are just numbers, but uh, say 20% saving you are expected. And then the hydrodynamics part, hull coating, if you if we have uh, special coatings now to smooth your hull, if you, you can use that one, they are adding small, small addition, right? You, you cannot have the entire efficiency by doing all these things, but you need to have a mix of everything. So then uh, hull foam optimization, that is uh, if you have a, a bulbous bow, which is uh, not uh, not uh, very sexy, so you can you can cut it. You can do the hydrodynamic calculation. You can cut it and then retrofit the bulbous bow, which with smooth smooth, smooth lines, hull lines, which reduces the ship hull resistance. That's what it does. And then you have this air lubrication uh, heating system. That is where you 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 inject uh, air on the hull from through some uh, nozzles and they, they create a, a blanket of micro bubbles which actually reduces the, <coughs> the friction between the hull <coughs> and the water. So that is adding, it's a gain for you. So but, uh, not seen in a way, where do they uh, insert these bubbles right along the ship? Or? No, actually they are emitted from the aft. Aft, you have some nozzles hidden in the aft, so they emitted, then it goes with the flow, it goes and then uh, creates a bubble, more bubble, like the line. Aft, when the ship is going forward, yeah. the bubbles are inside at the aft. Yes, there are actually nozzle space. Yeah. No. Nozzle space on, on uh, because this, this, this curtain is created only on the flank bottom. You, it is not effective on, on the side or if you have a, let's say, displacement uh, hull like this. If you have uh, this type of hull, it's not effective. You have to have a plain hull. So mostly it's only in the bottom area. They have a small, small nozzles through which they inject the uh, air and this air <coughs> form of cushion under it. But uh, now if you have seen this uh, this type of person, passenger ships are like that because some passenger ships with uh, sails you have no? when they are using the sail this tend to turn this way. Have you seen this one? It's because uh, this is uh, this is actually a combination of uh, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. So this, when the, if you, let's say, make a sail like this, and then when you have a air flow, what then does it, it creates low pressure here, and high pressure here, and then it creates a lift, and that lift, will move the ship forward, but this lift also have a resultant force. 
perpendicular to, to, to the shape. So that's why it tends to lead. So then, if you don't have this bit here, your ship will topple. So this creates an opposite force to, to stabilize. So you are in the so then uh, and the cleaning of heart and then you have machinery improvements you can improve your main engine your fuel systems your propellers your rudders all these can be improved and then you can also gain your lost energy from waste heat recovery And then batteries. But the problem we will discuss with the batteries, uh, batteries have certain limitations. Batteries need to be charged. You can't top your ship uh, at sea to, to charge the battery. So it's only giving you a certain small power range just to do a small power addition gain to the uh, total energy consumption. But that's why I said, as of now, there is no one single answer to this one. We have to burn the fuels, <coughs> do all these things, have batteries on board, just to attain what we want to attain. And these are the proposed fuels, LNG, LPG, biofuels, electrification, methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, Harvesting from the surroundings, that is your solar panel and everything. Now, problem with the solar panel, there is hardly any space on board. Most of the vessels we don't have space because we need the space for the cargo. And uh, the solar panels we have at this moment is not uh, for marine use. But there are some car carriers which they have fitted now. I have seen this one. Because car carrier top deck is the idling deck. You have only the ventilation on the top. So that sort of vessels can have certain amount of solar panels, but it is very, very, very small. Contribution is very small from there. But I don't know, maybe in the future, uh, there will be some solar panels that where you can use everywhere you can put it on the ship side, you can put it on, on the funnel or whatever, on the hatch top, which, which even the technology is moving fast, that probably will come. This is the uh, easiest way, I said, uh, speed reduction. Very efficient for new design because you can tune everything, your hull, your engine, your propeller, your gearbox, everything can be tuned to attain this one, not like uh, existing ship. So it's very easy, but but uh, existing ship, this is off the side because it is not meant to do that one, though we do it. So this is this admiralty equation that we learned uh, from uh, naval architects. This, this, see this, this power, break power is, here is equals to displacement into p to the power 3. So if you reduce this by 10%, you save a lot of energy. So this is the coating, hard coating, smooth coating, by applying a cleaning your hull and keeping it clean. You reduce the uh, resistance with the water and you save, say that's about. Is it with energy power? Yeah, energy power. This is the, the, the air blanket that we were talking. And this, this uh, ship is fitted with this system. So in the sea child, uh, the ship owner goes to, to see the performance on this, this thing, they normally insist 
and then long term performing and monitoring. And uh, the vendors claim that you will have 5% gain. I don't know whether this is true or not, but this is what the vendors say. The system manufacturers say that will give you 5% energy. There's separate complexes to be yeah. And also creating more energy requirement is more. Right? Yeah, but the, this, this, uh, these compressors, they say, are very low power, right? Uh, and it will not, uh, this, when you take 5%, it, it's still a gain for the ship owner. That's how these are designed. And this, uh, this is the hull optimization. Of course, new building you can do it nicely. Uh, you can uh, the, uh, the, the length and the breadth of the ship can be matched very finely during a new building. But uh, for an existing ship, you have to do additional uh, hydrodynamic calculations, and then you have to remove this part and then add a new part. It, it's costly. You need to do a Right, okay. But then return on investment, not sure. Because you need to spend money to do this. And design and retrofit, 1 to 20 percent gain. So these are numbers given by these designers and the vendors. Uh, it is not 100 percent true, but there are gains. That's why the people are using this. So this type of, they are called. Uh, Gate trackers. This is the new <coughs> development from from the Watsila. See, there is no rudder here at the center. You have to underpaluk <coughs> What they say is, if you have the rudder here, then your drag is too much, right? So when you place your rudder like this, you have less drag. Less drag means you save some energy and at the same time because they are they they occupy less space you can place it uh, as far as aft of your ship and then you can increase your cargo capacity during the design stage that's what they say this is a watsila design and there are other advantages as well improve maneuverability improve noise and vibration enhance crash stops Increase cargo capacity if it plays because it's placed out the as far as uh, of the ship on the upside. Yeah. So no, this work independently. No, they work tandem. This this one, this is the same propeller, the same type of propeller, but without uh, fins are fitted to the ships that we are building. Uh, you see these these. Blades are curved in such a way they create uh, less <coughs> rotational resistance or rotational uh, uh, the, the, the losses. Uh, these, these are smoothly curved. And you also have a fin here. What does it does they say if you if you don't have these fins, when the propeller turns at a certain RPM, there is a vortex created. Uh, it's like a like a hollow section, which is a lock set. So when you have this the water passes through these plates and through these veins, fins, this vortex is reduced. So there is a gain. Vibration is reduced, reduce rotational friction losses. This, this is also Watsila design. You have seen this uh, ducts on, on one side, yeah? Mm -hmm. We have seen no lull this yeah. minute. This is, this is what they do. They streamline the flow. Rather than having a violent flow, which is a loss, so they just streamline the flow, so you get maximum thrust. So this is the waste heat recovery. See, only 49.3% uh, from our burning fuel is going to the shaft. The rest is, is wasted here. 
So if you can gain, recover this heat from here, that means you are adding to your total power. Yeah, you are increasing your total power, that's a gain for you. So these are the other technologies uh, that, is, that are being used. Now these are pitted actually, these are called uh, uh, flattener rotors. These rotors can be turned on, on both way, clockwise and anti-clockwise and you have special uh, small motors uh, turning this one. And then uh, what happens? It works in the same way, this uh, aerodynamics theory. And there is a lift created, that lift will move the ship forward. Of course, uh, when you, depending on your wind direction, you can change the direction of the rope, right? If it is this way or that way, you can change. And these are the fixed uh, sails with the same principle. And they, there's some smaller vessels in Europe, they are trying this one also, this skype in the port. This is something that uh, everybody is talking <coughs> nowadays. This is very efficient, the, the hydrogen fuel cell, because they don't have moving parts. It's an electrochemical process that creates electricity. And because of they don't have moving parts, they are very, they are considered very efficient. But uh, storing on board, uh, using them on board is be difficult because they have to throw at very very high pressure so there is a risk actually and there are ships that uh, is using hydrogen well, but smaller vessel but they have big uh, long tanks inside the hull but uh, they are not very popular and you will see the temperature liquid hydrogen minus 253 centigrade degrees so this is not very popular this is a fuel, this is methane, there's only one carbon here, but as the, the fuel gets viscous, you have the carbon chains. So that's what we need to do on board. We want to get rid of this carbon and come down to lower carbon or CO carbon. Now these are the calorific value of the fuel. Solid carbon, if you burn, you get 53 kilojoules per gram, coal this much. Hydrogen, you will get 2.5 times better than carbon. That means if you have uh, hydrogen as fuel, it's a lot of energy. LNG, high energy density, but it takes more space. And the methane slip, methane slip is the one that I explained earlier. Because of that, uh, now, the world, everybody in the world argued this one is only a transitional fuel because of the heat and sleep. Methanol is another fuel being proposed and there are methanol ready vessels now, ammonia ready vessels. We have delivered this vessel with the notation ammonia ready, methanol ready. That means any time you want to convert, you can convert and you can use methanol or ammonia. So they are, they are in use now, but in smaller numbers. The first, uh, first uh, ammonia ready vessel was delivered under ABS class in 2022, the bulk carry. Uh, that vessel can use ammonia, but the only thing is you need to have a, uh, the ammonia bankering facility in the ports, but they are not yet available. But it will come. Uh -oh. <laughs> It's a big bulk area, actually, ammonia ready. It's running on a dual fuel engine. So anytime the, when the ammonia is, is uh, available, they can use. It was class built under the But to bunker and carry it very risky, very toxic, because nobody can see ammonia. No, they, they, what they say is uh, uh, ammonia is toxic. Uh, you can see this ammonia. No, but the smell, small smell you can detect. So that's the advantage. But the, the 
the STCW and the gas code, uh, they are all incorporated. You can use the rules and regulations are there. So, but all these wells, the, the problem is this, not yet available. And uh, the price, methanol you need 22 times the tank volume. They, they all have uh, limitations. But this one is, at this moment, is said to be the best. Low energy requirement, because ammonia is produced everywhere. Even our fertilizer, everything is urea, is ammonia. So it's easily produced. Production available, industrial scale, no problem. But you have health risk. You need additional safety measures because it's highly toxic, corrosive, flammable in, in this percentage. It will be flammable, but it will not go up to that one. Low odor threshold. So this is the advantage because if there is a little tiny leak, tiny and leak, you, you will know that. This, all the regulations in the gas code and the STCW are in place now. So that's why ammonia ready vessel, methanol ready vessel are coming now. Biofuels. This is another thing. Uh, these are produced in very small quantities. But the problem is, the, this can be made from edible crops. So, so the farmers will grow crops and give it to these factories because they will pay more. <laughs> we will not have anything to eat or less to eat because even the edible crops they can give it to these factories, they will certainly pay more and then produce fuel. These are the concepts, I think they, these are happening in small scale uh, in, in the world now. So this is the race to the future fuel. You see the ammonia is on top. This E ammonia is the ammonia is made uh, from eco fuel without burning uh, fossil fuel. Blue ammonia is that you burn fossil fuel. Uh, Biomethanol is also without burning uh, using uh, fossil fuel. So these these are the the expected uh, fuels for the future, but we don't know. Everything is the uh, we should try it then, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. This is the ship that uh, we delivered in 2022, September 23rd. Uh, this is being built uh, in Lockyard. Uh, we have 10 vessels like this. We just delivered, uh, not, not just delivered, we delivered in last year, 2022, September uh, 23rd. This is a small bar carrier, uh, actually general dry carbon ship. That's how we have uh, given the notation. Uh, we have a single hole. Here you have a gantry crane, only to, to open the hatch cover. There are nine hatch covers along the hatch. So we only use this gantry. It's not a cargo handling gantry, but only for the lifting of hatch oh. pontoon, pontoon cover, right? Nothing else. You see, these are the specifications. You have a single hole with uh, 6,969 cubic capacity, 5,000 head weight. Length overall is 89.96. This is very smart because if this goes to 90, you have to put a light bolt. So, <laughs> so there we don't have a light bolt, right? Uh, breadth is 15.4, maximum draft. Is 655, cross tonnage is this much. Main engine very small, 1600 running on MDO. Auxiliary engines, see only 129 kilowatt, only two plus uh, emergency generator with half a moon, so you can run it as an auxiliary engine as well. Sub generator, 800 kilowatts generating, bow thruster. It's small actually for a smaller vessel, and we have a battery pack of 994 kilowatts. That's a lot of energy here. Actually, with this battery alone, we ran during the sea trial uh, at maximum speed uh, about 
4 GB inside, only, only with the battery. And you have a reduction here, 1000 kilowatt to 1000 RPM, generate 1600. And then uh, for this is for the sharp generation, 800 kilowatt. And this is the propellant. It's uh, 165 RPM generating 2,400 kilowatts. And this is uh, the hull foam, uh, designed by Watsila. So that we use the flat garden. These are very efficient on this, this scale of ships. And this uh, propeller is, is the one that I showed you from Godzilla. It's a uh, curve. This is the inside. But the beauty of this ship is you have a clutch here and the clutch here. You can do wonders with this one. You have two clutches. You can isolate the main engine, you can isolate the propeller shaft, and you can run this one as a motor or generator. And uh, what Sila says, all these are tuned. He, the propeller, rudder, propeller, hull, gearbox, and the main engine, everything is tuned to, to attain the EEPI. So advantage of propulsion uh, hybrid as propulsion, successful hybrid insulation, this is what they say, 15 to 20 percent. But we were trying to test this one, but we could not. Because for this vessel, I will explain to you later, the batteries are doing something called peak shape, we will look at. This is the battery room. We have uh, this one module, this one you can remove actually. These two racks, you can remove this one. And this one module is 60 kilos in weight. One module, right? This has a 3.2 lithium ion battery cells inside, plus a BMS, battery management system. You can take it home and use it as off with this. But the only thing is these batteries are, uh, unlike the lithium phosphate batteries, these batteries are very high energy. So they, they, this, this whole room is air conditioned. So we maintain roughly about 20 degrees in this room. And this is uh, protected. You have uh, all the explosion proof, uh, gas detectors, uh, fire alarms, everything is fitted. And this, this uh, under the rack, uh, there is a cooling fan, always running, and is exhausted to outside. And there is another duct. If you have a thermal array between the between the modules or between the cells, uh, any any smoke or fire generated will stop the entire battery pack. It will shut down everything in this battery. So. This is, these are the advantage of uh, using batteries. The substantial fuel reduction on large vessel is from spinning reserves. Spinning reserves, sometimes we run, uh, really we want to run only two generators, but some keeping, yes, when you arrive or departure, you, you are sometimes at sea also, you run three because you are afraid. Yes? So this, this spinning reserve, can be provided by the batteries. You don't have to run uh, another generator. So you have the batteries for the reserve power, if you avoid it. And this peak shaving, I will show you what is peak shaving. And energy harvesting. Energy harvesting means, uh, if you have equipment like cranes on board, you can, uh, when you are lifting, of course, the crane, you, you, you won't power. But when you are lowering, there is, free power available for you, you can charge your batteries. So that is energy harvesting and the backup power. You can use the batteries as your backup power. This is peak shaving. Now if you 
consider this as your engine and this is your battery right battery with the storage system this is your propeller 